All right, all you pre-holiday celebrating listeners of the madness out there tonight, welcome back to Wonder the Radar. And one person we forgot to thank because the list of people we wanted to thank for a work in progress was so long, it actually got cut off. We definitely would love to thank not only Gravy Brown, and he's currently working on an album with a friend, by the way, hint, hint. And also another person that goes by the name of Mr. Jordan for being probably one of the greatest history teachers we've had to date due to the fact that not only was a diehard wrestling fan, but also was somebody who incorporated wrestling into, you know, social studies. Unheard of. And the reason I was the only person to get an A in this class just for those analogies alone. So keep on teaching, brother, and keep it up doing what you've been doing. And hopefully you can find somebody in class just like me who's a big wrestling fan you can help along the way with associating wrestling with social studies. Yeah, you know, fingers crossed that can happen in the future for you, man. But besides that little bit of a thank you to those two great gentlemen, and not to mention to segue completely into wrestling like we're gonna do, folks, I think it's time for us to see who was able to survive that triangular war as the dust began to settle from the 33 and a third edition of the Survivor Series from Rosemont, Illinois, aka Shikaka. Or should I say, from Chicago? You're out of here. Yeah, that's right, Maestro. You're out of here. Go on. Get out. Get out. Bound at the wrong moment. But besides that silly Ace Ventura moment, folks, the Survivor Series would kick off with the pre show match, which would be a battle royal. Really? A battle royal? Well, how silly it may be, folks, this battle royal would feature not only the Forgotten Sons, Lucha House Party, Zack Ryder, Kurt Hawkins, Imperum, Heavy Machinery, Brazongo, who I think at this point should call themselves the Fashion Police, the Revival, the OC, and especially the Street Profits from Monday Night Raw. And all of the NXT members during this said battle royal would get instantly eliminated due to the tag team work between Raw and SmackDown to make sure that they didn't quote unquote win the night as they would say in the previews for this show would then see none other than the OC getting a super kick to the outside of the ring leaving the team of Rude and Ziggler going one-on-one -on -one against the Street Profits, and yeah. Unfortunately, due to the frog splash that Montez Ford would try to go for, Robert Rude would push off Ford from the top rope, leaving the team of Rude and Ziggler to win this match via elimination. And also proves that sometimes trying to do top rope moves in a battle royal is a really, really bad idea. And hopefully he remembers this when the Royal Rumble comes around, because that's the exact same reason how Rob Van Dam got eliminated when he was in the Royal Rumble. Forgot where he was, and not to mention the fans was chanting for him to do a five star, so was I, and it cost him. But besides the Royal Rumble, which is coming in less than two months from now, folks, the next match to take place on the Survivor Series kickoff show would feature none other than Leo Rush going one-on-one -on -one against Kalisto and Akira Tozawa for a triple threat shot at the Cruiserweight Championship. And this match was non-stop action, folks, and would reach its conclusion with Kalisto and Akira Tozawa teaming up on none other than Leo Rush to pull off a very beautiful double C4 bomb, or what they call a Spanish fly from the top rope, leading directly into a Salida Del Sol from Kalisto, only for the man of the hour of NXT to pull off his final hour frog splash, which got a compliment from D'Lo Brown at one point in his career, for Leo Rush to get a point for NXT and to retain his Cruiserweight Championship via pinfall. 
And the next match to take place on the pre-show would feature none other than the Undisputed Era or Red Dragon from Ring of Honor of Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish to go one-on-one -on -one against the New Day and of course, the Viking Raiders for brand supremacy. And if you're wondering at home, like we said during a work in progress, Kyle O'Reilly on the main stage of the Survivor Series would do his classic guitar championship performance, which was absolutely awesome. And by the way, speaking of guitar performances, have anybody seen Elias? Anyone? Still missing. Right. Well, besides that, folks, during this match, action would go back and forth, including Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish pulling off two separate total eliminations that I got a feeling that Joey Styles was marking out for backstage. But when it came to try to kick the breath out of the Viking Raiders, no dice. And what would that leave the Viking Raiders to do to Undisputed Era? Well, toss them into the air for a Viking experience that they would never forget for Kyle O'Reilly to suffer that unfortunate move and for the Undisputed Era to fall to the Viking Raiders for the Viking Raiders to put one point on the board for Monday Night Raw via pinfall. And after that point obtained by Monday Night Raw, we would officially kick off the pay-per-view with the Women's Survivor Series match, which would feature Team Ripley going up against Team Banks, going up against Team Flair for brand supremacy. And during this match, my god, a lot of people thought that after Kylie Ray, and of course, none other than Io Shirai, the Queen of the Sky, after getting taken out during this match, that NXT would have a disadvantage. But unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, due to the massive egos of not only Sasha Banks, but also Charlotte Flair, who did pick up an elimination over Carmella with a natural selection from out of nowhere, and even would see Asuka getting an elimination of her own by taking out none other than Dana Brooke after Dana Brooke would take out her tag team partner during this match with a quick roll up. Let's just say Asuka would get in the face, or should I say the other way around, Charlotte would get in the face of Asuka, Asuka would get pushed to the ground, and Asuka would get a revenge in the form of a green mist to the eyes of none other than Charlotte, Charlotte would get hit with a woman's right, next thing you know, would get pinned and eliminated, Asuka would walk up the ramp and eliminate herself out of the set contest, and then when Natalya was the last person left on the team, along with none other than Ray Ripley for NXT, and even Sasha Banks for SmackDown after her whole team would get eliminated, Natalya would decide to trust none other than Sasha Banks during this match, after they were able to successfully eliminate not only the EST of NXT, and then would eliminate none other than Tony Storm with a sharpshooter crossface combination, which was very impressive. But Sasha Banks would have other plans by pulling Natalya by the hair and pinning her during this match for her to be the last woman standing next to Ray Ripley during this set match, or so we thought. Because none other than the Queen of the Sky, Io Shirai, along with none other than Kylie Ray, would help out their team captain to not only do a springboard missile drop kick to the face while distracting the referee, giving enough time for Ray Ripley to pull out her riptide, and to be a two-time winner, especially after the War Games match we saw last night with what she did. Yeah definitely proves that she is a team captain to be reckoned with, getting another point on the board for NXT by winning this said match. And not to mention proving that NXT will do anything to win this said match, including feigning injuries to fool the other teams. Very impressive. Very impressive indeed. And the next match for Brand Supremacy would feature the champions 
of the mid-card division, and I hate to say that because it puts a little bit of disrespect on their championship belts, which would feature none other than Undisputed Era representative Roderick Strong going up against Shinsuke Nakamura and the phenomenal United States champion AJ Styles. And by the way, we did get a chance to see the reveal for the new Intercontinental Championship. Absolutely beautiful look for the Intercontinental Championship. And I got a feeling the reason why they changed it had to do with Cody Rhodes. Because he was the one who brought the belt in in the first place, changing over from the old Intercontinental Championship that was held by the likes of not only Edge, Christian, Kane, and other superstars who are first ballot Hall of Famers in their careers. But besides the history of the Intercontinental Championship, folks, during this match, action would go back and forth, including the Messiah, the Backbreaker, pulling off more Backbreakers than submissions that Dean Malenko would know during this match, but would pay for it during the said contest in the form of a nasty version of the Doomsday device that would be a Kinshasa knee strike hitting him toward the ground for a near fall for Shinsuke Nakamura. But the trip to Kinshasa Canyon would continue during this set match for not only AJ Styles, but for Roderick Strong again, leading to both near falls. And even you would see none other than Sami Zayn running interference in this match, almost costing the phenomenal one to lose the set contest. But after getting rid of Sami Zayn, the phenomenal one would take to the skies where he was the most comfortable and hit a phenomenal forearm on Shinsuke. And just when he was about to go for the win, Roderick Strong would toss him out to the outside of the ring, pinning Shinsuke Nakamura and proving that the North American champion is dominant on the Survivor Series and putting another point on the board for Team NXT. My God! NXT is starting to sweep the board now, aren't they? <laughs> well, besides that, folks, the next match that would take place on this said pay-per-view would be for the NXT Championship, which would feature Pete Dunne the Bruiserweight going one-on-one -on -one against, and you know what's coming next, folks, Adam Cole, baby, for the NXT Championship. Man, I love saying that. And during this match, folks, action did not disappoint because of both of these guys who went through hell at war games, battered, broken, and bruised, would put on one hell of a show that none of us would ever forget because Pete Dunn would not only be able to hit his bitter end on two separate occasions for near fall and even his X-Plex during this match for near fall, and a nasty, disgusting sit-out powerbomb on Adam Cole for near fall, but would see the champion going back to his ROH days by pulling off a Panama Sunrise, not only inside of the ring, but on the apron, almost costing Pete Dunne a chance at championship gold via countout but still was able to get back inside the ring to receive the final flash to the back of the skull for near fall. But this match will come to an ecstatic end, folks, with Pete Dunn still going to the bitter end by trying to hit the bitter end on none other than Adam Cole for him to get reversed into a Padma Sunrise mid-flip. That was the craziest thing I've seen during this pay-per-view. And after that would happen, Pete Dunne would be dazed and confused and then would get hit with a final flash for the last time. Or is it the last flash? We keep forgetting what the actual name of the finisher is, but either way, it would lead to the gold staying in the camp of one Adam Cole, baby! For the Undisputed Era, despite losing one match tonight to leave victorious via pinfall. And just to let you know, after the match was over, Undisputed Era would celebrate up on the ramp and a potential match of the year candidate for us for the Indy Awards. And I'm really considering this one. <laughs> and the next match to take place on this set card, folks, 
would feature none other than the Yes Man himself, Daniel Bryan, going one-on-one -on -one against The Fiend. And no, I'm not gonna call him Bray Wyatt because that's gonna conflict with the El Cabong slash Quick Draw McGraw identity crisis he's currently going under. And during the said match, while he was trying to figure out who he was during the said contest, Bray Wyatt would receive a fury of kicks from Daniel Bryan only to do a couple of disgusting big boy sentons on the outside of the ring and damn near throw him through the announce table on the outside only for Daniel Bryan to respond back with a Sagat Tiger knee not only on the apron but from the top rope during the said contest. But Bray Wyatt would counteract or should I say, The Fiend would counteract with a neck snap in the ring, try to go for a pin, it would lead to a near fall. And according to the maestro during this match, The Fiend did not go for any pinfalls, it was mostly Daniel Bryan, and especially after hitting that Baizaku knee with the help of the Chicago fans chanting yes in that arena, was still not enough to defeat The Fiend, cause The Fiend would get back up on his feet, Hit him with a mandible claw, not once but twice, but on the first attempt would lead to a modified visual arm bar with the assist of the ropes, but that wouldn't help Daniel Bryan defeat the Fiend because next thing you know, mandible claw in the center of the ring, Daniel Bryan out gasping for air, Fiend goes for the pin, three seconds later, still your universal sweet tooth champion, none other than the Fiend. And as a warning for those who want to see that match who has epileptic seizures, be careful on watching certain points because there's a lot of strobe light effects. Just a heads up. And the next match to take place on this said pay-per-view would feature none other than the three-way men's war of the Survivor Series teams, which would feature Team SmackDown going up against Team Raw versus Team NXT, which featured not only Tommaso Ciampa, none other than Keith Lee, and I do believe Walter alongside with none other than the ultimate bro himself, Matt Riddle. Now, the reason why in the world it took us a while to figure out who the whole team was, because we were confused. They even called in people from NXT UK to try to take out the monster among men during this match. And my god, the war between Walter and Braun Strowman during this match was epic. But unfortunately short-lived due to the fact that after Walter would knock the big man off his feet and would try to run toward the corner to finish him off, he would get cut off at the crossroads by a terminating Claymore kick from out of nowhere for Walter to be eliminated. Then you had Shorty G going after Kevin Owens with a roll-up from out of nowhere to eliminate the Frankenstein monster. But before Kevin Owens got eliminated, he was able to get rid of Tommaso Ciampa during this match with a beautiful bullfrog frog splash to quote JBL. And then, yeah, for those who are wondering what happened to Damian Priest during this set contest, and I completely forgot about him, and so did the people, because he would get hit with an RKL from out of nowhere by the ultimate soul survivor of Randy Orton. But Randy Orton during this match would get eliminated by surprise by Matt Riddle with a roll-up. But then would get eliminated himself by an angry Randy Orton hitting him with an RKO. But in this case, since it's Matt Riddle, an RK bro. Yes, Maestro, I know that was a terrible joke, but it's Matt Riddle we had to squeeze it in somewhere. And as the match continued with eliminations happening left and right, Unfortunately, the dissension between Team SmackDown would begin the show because Baron Corbin would end up costing Ali his spot on the team by pulling it at his leg, giving Seth Metal Steph Rollins enough time to black out the hometown hero for the crowd to boo Seth Rollins and Baron Corbin and for Baron Corbin to get his comeuppance in the form of a hellacious fear for him to get eliminated. 
then you would see Keith Lee in action in the best way no possible, getting a rid of Monday Night Rollins once and for all during this match, leaving the fight between none other than Keith Lee against Roman Reigns and in a very impressive one-on-one -on -one match. And Maestro said, am I forgetting something? Yes, I am. I almost forgot to mention before Drew McIntyre got eliminated, he was able to eliminate the monster among men without pinning him, but actually hitting him with a Claymore kick after Keith Lee and Braun Strowman, who after Braun Strowman would try to do his classic run around the ring like a Mack truck, hitting him in the pass, and just, you know, clashing with him in mid-air, causing the monster to lose via countout. Proving that for three years, almost in a row, that the monster can only be eliminated via countout. He has never been pinned in Survivor Series history, always eliminated via countout. Almost like the big show. Yeah. So that puts him in a good spot. Well, you know, history-wise, not during this match. But back to the end of the action, folks, because action will go back and forth between Roman Reigns and Keith Lee, including Keith Lee doing a very impressive spirit bomb for a near fall, and even Roman Reigns getting a Superman punch for a controversial two count that Corey Graves thought was a three, and same thing with that spirit bomb. But all doubts would be thrown out the window once Keith Lee decided to go for his second rope moonsault and miss, only for Roman Reigns to turn him inside out with a hellacious beer, for Roman Reigns to be a sole survivor for the first time in his career, to put a point up again for the blue brand via pinfall. And after the match was over, a little sign of respect between Keith Lee and Roman Reigns, proving that they put on a hell of a performance for tonight, and proving that Keith Lee is a future star here in the WWE. But then again, for those longtime fans of Keith Lee, they already knew this man was a star. He just needed the proper stage and lighting to prove how limitless he is. And he really is limitless. My God, that man is impressive. And speaking of impressive, but not the way you would think, folks, the next match to take place on this said pay-per-view would feature none other than Brock Lesnar going one-on-one -on -one against the man of mystery himself, Rey Mysterio. And Rey Mysterio to prove that he has to go to a place he's never been before would dress up as the Joker. And no, not the Jokers of the past, but the Joker of the previous movie that came out in theaters that tried to take out Brock Lesnar. But unfortunately, the second that pipe that he had in his hand left his hands, Brock Lesnar went on a full suplex city assault, suplexing Rey Mysterio around the ring and even outside of the ring with a belly-to-belly -belly suplex on the headboard for one of the announce tables and even suplexing him on the pipe. Ugh. Rey Mysterio going back first on a steel pipe from a German suplex was enough to bring out Dominic to try to throw in the towel, but gave enough of a distraction for Rey Mysterio to hit him with a low blow, and for a father-son picture-perfect Kodiak moment of a 619, for not only Dominic to hit a frog splash, but Rey to hit a frog splash for a intense two count for Brock Lesnar to basically push them both off like they were nothing. Then Dominic decided in the closing moments of this match, you know what, I'm gonna go to the top rope again and would pay for it with a trip to Germany, as they would say on Up Up Down Down, with a German suplex and then Rey Mysterio flying through the air would get caught in the center of a storm with an F5 for the Beast to retain his universal, scratch that, WWE Championship via pinfall. To the shock and dismay of Paul Heyman who was worried throughout the entire thing that was going on. And it also proved to me that Dominic has a future in WWE, and I really do hope he shows up in the near future for more in-ring competition. Just not against Brock Lobster. 
come on. The man almost got torn limb from limb there tonight. And the last match and the main event for the Survivor Series for this year would feature none other than the Queen of Spades herself that makes me think of Motorhead at any time when she comes to the ring because of the name of her nickname. Shayna Baszler going up against Bayley, who looked like Queen Amidala, going up against none other than the man, Becky Lynch, in a triple threat match for brand supremacy. And during this match, action would go back and forth and Bayley would try to sneak in a cheap shot at any time that she could and would pay for it with not only a kick to the face, the same as Becky Lynch when she had Bayley in the disarmor, and would even see Becky Lynch getting taken out during this match with a power bomb through the table. Or according to the maestro, the table was still standing, but she was behind it and was not moving. And that would give enough opportunity for the former hugger turned dark to hit a Bailey the belly for a near fall, and the Queen of Spades would have enough of that and decide to try to choke her out with the Ferracuda clutch, and actually would see Bailey with a tear in her eye tapping like a drummer boy on a little tiny drum to prove that the dominant brand is NXT by getting four points to SmackDown's two and Raw's one, the close-out Survivor Series for this night. Or so I thought, because the second the Queen of Spades decided to celebrate on the announce table, Becky Lynch came to, swept the leg almost like if this was the Karate Kid, and would finish things off with a New Jersey jam, sending Shayna Baszler through the table, breaking the table for tonight, reaching our table breaking quota for the man to celebrate on the top of the German announce table for the Survivor Series to truly close out for this year. And in my opinion, folks, as exciting as the Survivor Series was, with no stakes on the line for that whole pay-per-view with them quote-unquote winning the night, still think it's meaningless. But I got a feeling Triple H is gonna definitely make it worth their while, especially for one of my new favorite superstars in the form of Ray Ripley. Talk about a badass. And join us next time, ladies and gentlemen, when we come into your homes for the final and coldest pay-per-view of the year. None other than tables, ladders, and chairs from Minneapolis, Minnesota on December 15th in less than three weeks from this said pay-per-view. My God, they're really going to make us work for it, aren't they? <laughs> And with that said, folks, we might as well head back into this music, and when we return, we'll be back with more of that radioactive madness that only Under the Radar can provide right after this. So don't go anywhere just yet, folks, and stay tuned. 